In the world of aviation, the statistics are crystal clear. Flying is over a hundred times safer than hitting the road in your trusty car. But let's not kid ourselves. Even one airplane disaster can take away hundreds of lives. And you won't believe how it can all come crashing down because of a single faulty bolt. Alaska 261, we are uh, in a dive here. So, can you get sucked out of a hole in the fuselage, like in the movies? What are your odds of survival if the plane goes down in the mountains or the vast ocean? And what are the tiny details that lead to deadly crashes? Now, let's take a leap back to June 10, 1990, when Captain Timothy Lancaster took flight on British Airways Flight 5390. He did the usual routine, activated autopilot, and unbuckled his seatbelt. The plane was cruising at an altitude of 5,300 meters when the unimaginable happened. The windshield in front of the captain blew out. Within seconds, a catastrophic decompression occurred, blowing open the cockpit door, filling it with fog and swirling wind, and, worst of all, sucking Captain Lancaster out through the hole. But by some miracle, his legs got tangled up in the control panel, and he was held in place by the insane wind outside. While panic erupted among the passengers, the crew sprang into action. One flight attendant grabbed the captain by the waist, and another wrestled the detached cockpit door back into place, allowing the second officer, Alastair Atchison, to stabilize the aircraft. But the autopilot disengaged, and the plane was rapidly losing altitude, putting the survival odds of 87 people on board in jeopardy. Even as Atchison initiated an emergency descent, he wasn't sure if he could land the plane alone. To make matters worse, the flight attendant holding Captain Lancaster was quickly tired from the extreme wind and cold, so his colleague had to take over. The crew was sure that Captain Lancaster wouldn't survive a flight with such excruciating pressure and a chilling temperature of minus 70 degrees Celsius. The doubts crept in about whether they should continue holding on to him. However, Atchison firmly forbade any thoughts of letting go, fearing that the captain's body might get sucked into the engines, dooming the plane to a catastrophic crash. Atchison established contact with Southampton Airport and secured permission for an emergency landing. At that moment, the fate of everyone on board rested squarely on Atchison's shoulders, 22 minutes after the incident. He miraculously managed to bring the plane down safely. The rescue teams were on the scene in no time. Remarkably, the passengers were scared, but mostly unharmed. Captain Lancaster, on the other hand, was a different story. Paramedics had to check his pulse to officially confirm his survival. Surprisingly, he was still alive. He later revealed that he had turned his head to create a small air pocket for breathing, but quickly lost consciousness. Astonishingly, Captain Lancaster suffered only from frostbite, a broken arm and finger, a few cuts and bruises. After a course of medical treatment and psychological therapy, he was back in the cockpit, ready to fly just five months later. The investigation revealed that the catastrophe occurred because nobody double-checked the plane after replacing the windshield. The engineer responsible for the job also decided to replace a few bolts, opting for half a millimeter thinner ones, causing the windshield to give away. Yet the happy ending of Flight 5390 is a rare exception, and the flight attendant Michelle Honda, together with the crew of Aloha Airlines Flight 243, can surely attest to that. Fast forward to April 28, 1988, when their 19-year-old Boeing had accumulated between the Hawaiian Islands over 35,000 hours of flight time and undergone 90,000 takeoffs and landings. On that fateful day, the plane passed its inspection and completed three flights before taking off from Hilo to Honolulu, with 95 people on board. The 35-minute flight started just like any other. First Officer Madeline Tompkins and Captain Robert Schornsteimer were at the helm with Michelle Honda and two other flight attendants assisting passengers. But when the Boeing reached an altitude of 7,300 meters, things took a turn for the worse. A sudden decompression occurred in the cabin. Within a few seconds, the roof over the first six rows ripped off and the cockpit door got blown away. At that very moment, flight attendant Clarabelle Lansing was talking to passengers, but in the blink of an eye, she got sucked out through the hole. Another flight attendant was showered with debris and lost consciousness. Michelle Honda suffered a head injury, but managed to stay conscious and help passengers. However, there was little she could do for those who found themselves out in the open sky at the temperature of minus 45 degrees Celsius and wind speeds of 500 kilometers per hour. 
Because of these extreme conditions, she couldn't even reach the cockpit to check if the pilots were okay, as radio contact had been cut off. Meanwhile, Madeline Tompkins and Captain Schornsteimer saw the open sky where the roof used to be and realized they were facing a serious problem. Schornsteimer, a seasoned Air Force veteran, took control of the aircraft and initiated a rapid descent, while Tompkins established contact with Maui Airport's air traffic controllers. After some frantic communication, they obtained clearance for landing, but pulling it off would be nothing short of a miracle. The plane started rocking from side to side after the decompression, and it later turned out they couldn't slow down to the necessary 250 kilometers per hour. The slower the plane got, the harder it became to control. During all this chaos, Michelle Honda felt the plane gradually descending and decided to secure her unconscious colleague, who lay at the edge of the torn fuselage. She thought the woman was already gone. When Captain Schornsteimer approached the airport for landing preparations, an indicator showed that the front landing gear hadn't been deployed. However, due to the severe damage, he had no choice but to go for the landing. However, this was far from their only problem. He managed to reduce the speed to only 315 kilometers per hour, which was 75 more than the recommended speed for landing. And then the left engine of the Boeing failed. Schornsteimer had no way of knowing if any passengers were still alive on board, but he made a life-changing decision, directing the plane toward the runway. In a feat that defied the laws of physics, he managed to land the plane. The landing still goes down in aviation history as one of the most incredible ones. According to basic physics, the plane should have broken down to pieces while still in the air. Apart from the fuselage and engine, both wings, the tail, and stabilizers were heavily damaged. However, the most astonishing part of the story is that everyone on the plane survived. 65 people sustained injuries, with some being quite severe. The rescuers were overwhelmed and even had to transport the injured in tourist buses. The only casualty of this aviation catastrophe was Clarabel Lansing, a flight attendant who had been working for 37 years. The primary cause of the disaster was the old age of the aircraft. It had worn down rivets, poorly joined fuselage parts, and metal corrosion. But perhaps Lansing's life could have been spared if a passenger who had noticed a crack above the cockpit before takeoff hadn't failed to report it. As for the passengers of Alaska Airlines Flight 261, they couldn't have seen any similar red flags to prevent what was about to happen. On January 31st in 2000, this flight took off from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, heading for Seattle with a stop in San Francisco. The 83 passengers included 34-year-old Colleen Horley, celebrating her birthday in Mexico, with wedding preparations awaiting her back home. The flight was going smoothly for a little over two hours, but near Los Angeles, something went terribly wrong. The pilots noticed problems with the horizontal stabilizers, a critical component for controlling the aircraft. So Captain Ted Thompson and First Officer William Tansky reported the malfunction to the folks in Los Angeles. Both pilots were ex-military and seasoned aviators, but they couldn't understand why the stabilizers weren't working. They suggested making an emergency landing but the dispatcher insisted the flight should stick to its course. But then the unexpected happened. At an altitude of 9,600 meters, the plane suddenly entered a steep dive. In just 80 seconds, it was nose diving like crazy. The pilots did their best, all the while keeping the people on the ground up to date about the issue. Center Alaska 261, we are uh, in a dive here. When Captain Thompson calmly said their plane was going down, the shocked dispatcher asked him to repeat it. Yeah, we're at a 26,000 feet. We are in a vertical dive. Not a dive yet, but uh, we've lost vertical control of our airplane. Flight 261's pilots confirmed they'd lost control of the plane. There was a tense silence in the control center until Captain Thompson delivered yet another message. 261, we're at 24,000 feet, kind of stabilized. They managed to level the plane at around 7,300 meters. But when the captain assured the dispatcher everything was under control, First Officer Will Tansky dryly chimed in, stating that it wasn't the case. The control center and everyone else agreed with Tansky. After getting clearance for an emergency landing in Los Angeles, the captain informed the passengers, trying not to scare them, but people who had just lived through a nosedive weren't fooled. Colleen Horley figured her wedding plans were up in smoke. Meanwhile, 
Captain Thompson wanted to make sure he could handle the plane during landing, so he requested clear airspace and permission to descend to 3,000 meters above the Gulf of California. If things went south, they could make an emergency water landing to avoid crashing into residential areas. That was the last message from Flight 261. Uh, Alaska 261, you over here with me yet, sir? The dispatcher couldn't reach Air Alaska anymore, so they asked the pilots of two nearby planes to check if they could spot the liner. In 19 seconds, they received the worst possible answer. Hi there, Del Tecne. That plane has just started to do a big, huge plunge. At that moment, when Alaska Airlines pilots were gearing up for landing, the plane's stabilizers went completely haywire, and it entered another steep dive. Then, out of nowhere, it flipped upside down and began a slow recovery. Just like that, it crashed into the water at 400 kilometers per hour. And he just hit the water. The aviation disaster happened near Anacapa Island. All 88 people on board perished. But the rescuers managed to find only four bodies. The rest vanished in the ocean's depths. Despite families seeking answers, Alaska Airlines claimed they had inspected the plane the day before the crash. However, the investigation revealed that the crash was caused by a single screw responsible for the operation of the horizontal stabilizers. It had worn down significantly due to lack of lubrication. And that's not even the whole story. It turned out that at the time of the disaster, federal investigators were already looking into prior violations at the airline, and Alaska Airlines mechanic John Leotine had provided them with loads of evidence. But in 2001, Leotine suddenly cut a deal with the airline and the case against them never materialized. Instead of justice, the victims' families received only a memorial with nameplates. Meanwhile, Alaska Airlines remains one of the largest airlines in North America, just like Japan Airlines in Asia. Their planes still carry loads of passengers on busy domestic routes between Tokyo and Osaka. On August 12, 1985, an 11-year-old Boeing was flying this route. During 123 flight of Japan Airlines, a total of 524 people were on board, including the crew. One of them was a young flight attendant, Yumi Ochai, who, for a change, was flying as a passenger this time. The plane took off and started ascending. In the cockpit that day, they had Captain Masami Takahama, First Officer Yutaki Sasaki, and the highly experienced flight engineer, Hiroshi Fukuda. So, what could have possibly gone wrong? But just 12 minutes after takeoff, at an altitude of approximately 7,300 meters, something went boom on board. The plane was instantly engulfed in a dense fog, and oxygen masks dropped in the cabin and cockpit. Yumi Ochae and the other flight attendants rushed to help the passengers, while the pilots realized something terrible had happened. The plane started shaking like a ship in a stormy sea. The crew immediately contacted air traffic control and requested permission to return to the airport. Uh, okay, it's been, uh, one, two, three, uh, we just, uh, we just, uh, uh, oh, we just, uh, to, uh, uh, What the pilots didn't know was that they had lost their vertical stabilizer, the same component that caused the Alaska air crash. And, as we know, controlling the plane is nearly impossible without it. Yet, the pilots noticed something else that left them speechless. The plane's hydraulic system had failed, which was responsible for deploying the landing gear, controlling the aircraft, and braking. So, the out-of-control Japan Air Flight 123 continued to fly deeper into the country, losing altitude and shaking like crazy. Still, the crew fought on, and at an altitude of about 4,600 meters, the Boeing stabilized. The air traffic controller thought the danger was over and got in touch with Japan Air once again. But Captain Takahama responded that the plane was uncontrollable and their efforts were in vain. Yet they continued to struggle, up until the moment when the Boeing nosedived into Mount Takamagahara. The plane quickly lost speed, and Captain Takahama shouted out commands to the second officer. Until this point, they managed to keep the flight in the air for 32 minutes after the explosion. But then, the right wing of the Boeing struck trees on the mountain ridge. Takahama cried, this is it in Japanese, and the plane plunged, exploding seconds later. <laughs> A moment before this, Yumi Ochai had felt several strong jolts, and then her seat was torn free, pinning her. She couldn't unfasten her seatbelt, 
leaving her trapped with no way to escape if a fire broke out. Approximately 20 minutes after the crash, the US military, stationed nearby, was ready to send rescue teams, but the Japanese authorities forbade them from approaching. The accident happened in the mountains at an altitude of 1,565 meters at 6.56 p.m. When the Japanese helicopters finally reached the crash site, the darkness and difficult terrain made it impossible for the rescuers to land. From above, they couldn't see Yumi frantically waving for help. The rescuers decided to return at first light, while Yumi listened in horror as the helicopter flew away. After that, she heard only the heavy breathing of other passengers and the cries of the boy calling his mother. However, later, everything got engulfed in silence. After 16 long hours, the rescue team found the plane's tail section and noticed a woman who was still moving. It was Yumi, who had miraculously survived the night. Along with her, Hiroko Yoshizaki and her eight-year-old daughter, Makiko, also survived. They had been sitting in the rear of the plane. Twelve-year-old Kaiko Kawakami was found on top of a tree, mostly unharmed. Unfortunately, no one else survived. Among the wreckage, many farewell notes were found. In the final minutes before the plane went down, passengers bid farewell to their loved ones and to life itself. I never dreamed that the dinner we had last night would be our last together. Medical professionals confirmed that far more people survived the crash but didn't make it out. So Flight 123 claimed 520 lives. This tragedy happened because seven years earlier, the rear pressure bulkhead in that Boeing had been poorly repaired. Over time, it cracked, leading to catastrophic decompression and the deadliest aviation accident in Japan's history. So, if a single malfunctioning component can lead to such a disaster, is aviation really as safe as we believe? The truth is that deadly accidents can happen even on aircraft that seem perfectly fine, some of which don't even make it off the ground. This is the story of the KLM and Pan Am flights. On March 27, 1977, the Spanish Gran Canaria airport was shut down due to a bomb threat. Flights scheduled to land there had to divert to Tenerife. The passengers were understandably frustrated, and it was up to Pan Am flight attendant Dorothy Kelly to keep them calm. That day, she was in first class instead of her usual spot in the plane's rear. The senior flight attendant was nervous about making announcements because of her French accent, so she switched places with Dorothy. On board Pan Am, there were 380 passengers, mostly elderly folk. In contrast, Dutch KLM was carrying 235 passengers, including 52 children. The Tenerife airport had only one runway, and the extra flights made it overcrowded. Moreover, as they were given the green light to proceed, the weather took a turn for the worse, with thick fog covering the airport. Finally, the KLM flight received instructions from the controller, move to the end of the runway, make a 180 degree turn, and report ready for takeoff. Captain Jacob Van Zanten followed the instructions and told his crew to prepare for takeoff. Meanwhile, Captain Victor Grubbs of Pan Am was instructed to follow the same runway, turn off at the third taxiway, and continue parallel to the runway. However, the controller's thick Spanish accent made things unclear, so Captain Grubbs asked for clarification. You want us to turn left at Charlie 1, taxiway Charlie 1. Negative, negative. Taxi straight ahead. Uh, up to the end of the runway and main taxi drive. When Pan Am reached the third taxiway, they were told to turn 135 degrees, which was nearly impossible for their plane. So, the Pan Am crew decided there must have been a mistake and proceeded to the fourth taxiway. In the meantime, KLM reported ready for takeoff. The controller gave them instructions, which Captain Van Zanten perceived as a takeoff clearance. So he began his takeoff roll. The second officer reported, we're going, to the control center. Because this phrase wasn't standard, the controller understood it as a sign of readiness and replied okay. Captain Van Zanten believed he had clearance to take off. At the same time, Pan Am's visibility had dropped to 100 meters, and they couldn't find the right turnoff because the runway lights weren't working. When KLM was already taking off, the controller asked Pan Am to let them know when they would clear the runway. Uh, Alpha 1736, report runway clear. Okay, well, report runway clear. The KLM flight engineer heard this and nervously told the pilots that the other plane appeared to be still on the runway. 
Yet Captain Van Zanten was convinced he had received permission to take off and confidently replied that everything was fine. When the Pan Am pilots saw another aircraft approaching them, they turned their engines to full throttle to get off the runway as quickly as possible. However, the KLM captain also picked up speed, hoping to take off in time, but it was already too late. As KLM accelerated to a speed of 259 kilometers per hour, it collided with Pan Am. At that moment, flight attendant Dorothy Kelly was having coffee with two colleagues when the impact sent her crashing through the floor into the cargo hold. Incredibly, she remained conscious and quickly realized what had happened. She started directing passengers to an opening in the fuselage. Suddenly, a fire broke out. Unfortunately, when the firefighters arrived, they went to the KLM plane, which was beyond help. All 248 people on board the KLM flight perished. However, Pan Am's rescuers didn't arrive until 20 minutes later. During that time, Dorothy, with a head injury and a broken arm, continued to save passengers. She managed to pull the captain away from the wreckage just seconds before an engine exploded. Afterward, they both helped the injured. They later found out that only 61 people from their flight survived, while the rest, 335 people, died. This tragedy remains the deadliest in aviation history, claiming 583 lives. This catastrophe happened due to misunderstandings between the control center, the captains, and their crews. And even though many of the most horrific aviation accidents occurred decades ago, fatal accidents continue to happen with alarming regularity. Sometimes, the tiniest details, like a misunderstanding with an air traffic controller or just a half millimeter thinner screw, can lead to disaster. Don't forget to fasten your seatbelts, hit that like button, and subscribe to our channel because it's the little things that keep us flying.